Hi, welcome. So we're going to go ahead and start. I'm Becca Konimopoulos with Not an Alternative or an arts collective that has, um, as of last night, opened a new museum called the Natural History Museum. So welcome. Um, we are, as of this week, officially a dues-paying member of the American Alliance of Museums. Um, what you see here, we are um, kind of conceiving of it less as an art exhibition as much as presenting our subject of study, um, which is natural history museums. Um, and I want to encourage you to check out at the um, back there on the wall is this essay called Exhibiting the Gaze, um, which I think kind of contextualizes the display that you see here um, and brings it to life. And the other thing that brings this museum to life is you. Um, it's constructed to uh, uh, have at the center the, the visitors um, and for all of the panels and workshops and discussions that we'll be hosting over the course of the next month. So I'll talk a little bit about um, upcoming events uh, after the panel, um, but we're imagining that they present the historical and theoretical um, framework for all of our museum's programs going forward. So like traditional natural history museums, we present exhibitions, um, expeditions. This is our mobile museum, 15 passenger um, shuttle bus that we'll be taking to uh, contested environmental sites around the country um, with scientists and members of the public and artists. Um, we also do educational workshops and public programming. Unlike traditional natural history museums, we make a point to include and highlight the social and political forces that shape nature. Um, in particular, with this programming series over the next month, we are interrogating the influences that affect the atmospheric climate on Earth, as well as the political and funding climate within natural history museums. Um, you may not need me to tell you that um, as nonprofit institutions, it's becoming harder and harder to get funded. There's increasing pressure um, to respond to market, market pressures and market forces. And so we're seeing um, more and more of the 1% and the fossil fuel industry embedding themselves in cultural institutions and spaces of science communication and education. Um, at the same time that they turn around and lobby for the sequester and budget cuts. Um, so this is something that we wanted to respond to. This is, on the one hand, a critical project um, that borrows heavily from uh, our influences, from the folks like Mark Dion and Hans Hacke, who are here today, um, and also uh, very inspired by more recent iterations of the institutional critique practice um, that Gavin Grindon will be talking about in the UK, such as Liberate Tate and Art Not Oil and 2BP or Not 2BP, um, all uh, practices which involve borrowing the vocabulary of the institution, um, and in our case, the uh, aesthetics, the pedagogical models, and the presentation forms, but for us to represent a different perspective on nature, you know, one that includes um, man, and the social and the political, um, and one that takes a position on nature as a commons. And we're imagining this to be a curatorial platform over time through the website, thenaturalhistorymuseum.org, and uh, our various other platforms lifting up the work of uh, climate activists and environmental activists, um, as well as socially engaged artists who are working at the intersection of art, science, and the environment. Um, so I'm not going to say too much more. Um, I do come out of activism, and we have a tradition of passing around a sign-in sheet um, or sign-up sheet if you're interested in uh, finding out more about our museum's programmings, uh, programming and um, opportunities for volunteering and so on. Please sign this. And I'm going to introduce, oh, I should also say, um, Part of the inspiration, or perhaps our muse for this project, is David Koch um, of the Koch brothers, who sits on the board of New York's Natural History Museum, as well as the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, and is a major donor and exhibit sponsor. Um, so uh, th that was the initial inspiration. Um, we saw this as a project in which we can occupy the institution. 
um, but then started to kind of broaden our conceptualization of it and uh, to consider occupying institutionality as a form in and of itself. Um, so this is um, a bona fide museum that we um, plan to continue for years to come um, in many different cities. And uh, so if you are interested in getting involved, um, let us know. And I'm going to introduce Steve Lyons who um, has been involved in the Natural History Museum research group over the last years that we've been developing these ideas. And he's an artist and an art historian um, based in Concordia University uh, up in Montreal. And he's going to introduce the panel. Steve. Hello, um, welcome to our afternoon panel with Mark Dion, Gavin Grinden, and Hans Hake. Uh, we've called this panel The Museum Divide Beyond Institutional Critique. And our hope is that we can together think through not only the history of institutional critique, but also the potential for institutional critique to act in the present. So what kind of divides and internal fissures run through uh, and between institutions? How might the long history of institutional critique offer strategies for occupying these divides? Before we jump right into the presentations, I actually want to take a few minutes, like eight minutes, to sketch out a few of the ideas about institutional critique that the Natural History Museum Research Group has been collectively developing over the past six months or so. So when the practices of what we now call institutional critique first came to the fore, it denoted a wave of artists that were responding collectively and uh, as individual practitioners to the failure of, hum of museums and galleries to defend public service in the face of private interests. So museums, those institutions originally founded as zones for the production and defense of a public sphere, were at the turn of the 1970s seen as repressive, stiflingly bureaucratic, exclusive, hierarchical, and unaccountable. Artists like Hans Hake, took notice to uh, the sometimes insidious entanglement between museums and big business, drawing our attention to the fact that corporate sponsors functioned as censors, as direct impediments to the free expression allegedly promoted by public museums. Many artists associated with what has been called the first wave of institutional critique directly confronted their audiences with a startling disharmony between what institutions practiced and what they preached. The antagonistic nature of these projects sometimes obscures the fact that many of them were not explicitly anti-institutional. More often than not, they in indicated that our public institutions were worth fighting for. As sites that both represented and supplied basic societal infrastructure, institutions were necessary and better institutions were possible. More recently, market pressures on a wider array of social and cultural institutions have only intensified. Instead of operating through mechanisms of centralized control, contemporary power relations are fragmented, decentered, networked, and privatized. Institutions are crumbling, losing power and resources. This disintegration of, of collective infrastructure reveals that institutions were never as unified or total as some of their critics may have implied. Perhaps given these new conditions, we should recalibrate our relationship to institutions to not only imagine new ways of opposing, dissolving, or drawing lines of flight from existing institutional power, but also to imagine how we can occupy existing institutional forms and to use them as tools, resources for the production of culture, collectivity, and social solidarity. This speculative proposal that institutions can be occupied and reappropriated as forms of collective counterpower is, I think, among the driving ideas behind the Natural History Museum as a pop-up museum and institutional framework. And the history of institutional critique might offer a number of tactics and tools for opening up the space for reappropriation, precisely because artists involved in institutional critique have unceasingly affirmed that institutions are not simply monolithic totalities marked by ideological consistency, but are collective infrastructures marked by internal divisions conflicting value systems and dissatisfaction from within. 
In order to generate power and in order to be seen as whole, institutions presuppose and actively negate forms of dissent. Those ideas, ideologies, and alternatives that, if made visible, uh, would destabilize the institution's power. Thus, every institution is marked by an exclusion. In order to be seen as a stable institution, it has to exclude those forces that would render its borders porous and its power unsustainable. The museum, like other institutions, is marked by this division between what it makes visible, what it presents as matter of fact, and what it bars from view. For example, in the case of tr traditional natural history museums, the influence of social and political forces on the shape of nature tends to be ignored. One of uh, the primary jobs of institutional critique has been to expose the borders of the institution to reveal its frame by drawing notice to what it represses. Mark Dion, Gavin Grindon, and Hans Hacke present different ways we can see the museum as divided. They provide models for understanding how the infra-thin space between the inside and outside of the museum could be put under a microscope, while showing how the museum is not just a collection of objects, but also a collective of agents. And I think this last point is particularly worth expanding on, especially if we are to recover what is worth saving in our public institutions. So how can we describe the museum as an assemblage of actors endowed with the agency to determine its shape and direction? Pierre Bourdieu, whose cultural sociology directly or indirectly influenced many of the artists and activists now associated with institutional critique, has offered a useful framework for understanding the role that agency plays in the production and reproduction of institutional power. By emphasizing that power structures are reproduced in practice, he frames institutions as, embodied, as, some, uh, as an embodied in assemblage of actors, each with his or her own idea, own interests and investments in reproducing or contesting the order of things. Of course, Bourdieu's ideas have come down to the world of art through uh, the work and writings of artists like Hans Hake and Andrea Fraser. Uh, Fraser, uh, as is well known, has continually stressed that institutions are not abstract but are embodied, that we produce and reproduce an institution's power relations when we speak in its name. While well, Fraser's mantra, uh, famous mantra, when it comes to institutional critique, I am the institution, has notably been recent, uh, and recently been attacked by Brian Holmes, Gerald Roenig, and others for advocating a kind of capitulation before various forms of instrumentalization. It seems important to acknowledge the important, though perhaps incomplete, question she's repeatedly asked since her first performances in the 80s. Who can speak on behalf of an institution? Its employees, the artists and curators it invites to produce uh, content and services, or can institutions also be hijacked by anyone who convincingly performs in their name, even without holding the credentials to do so? In other words, can institutions be appropriated, used, or made common, both from within their bounds and by external agents? This is all to say that if institutions are to be reappropriated and put to use, we need to recognize ways of speaking in their name without necessarily operating under their authority. And if we can recognize institutions for both what they are, collective infrastructures, and for how they can be seen in the most general sense as unimpeachable and monolithic totalities or entities, uh, the question might become this. How can institutions be radicalized and put to use in progressive ways, both from within their bounds and in coordination with outside pressure movements? So if we recognize that when we speak in the name of institutions, we are occupying those institutions and the totalities that they stand for. And if we recognize that in occupying institutions, we hold the power to reproduce or redirect them, make them better, then we can begin to conceive of institutions as valuable resources, as powerful instruments for the production of collective solidarity and the amplification of visibility. And I think that's a really important thing. Institutions lend visibility. This panel brings together three speakers who have fearlessly entered into museums, recognizing not only their problems, so the social and political forces that they tend to exclude, but also insisting on the possibilities for museums to be truly public institutions. Institutions that produce common histories, that provide forms of collective power. In this panel, we want to consider how, whether invited or uninvited, 
Artists and activists have borrowed the vocabulary of the museum and in doing so extended the political potential already dividing the institution from within. So we have three speakers as, we've, as we now know and they're going to speak in the following order, Mark Dion and then Gavin Grindon and then Hansa Hake. And I'll just introduce them all now and then we'll, uh, we'll get right to the talks so I don't take up too much more time. So Mark Dion, uh, many of you uh, know his work, uh, is known for making art out of field work incorporating elements of biology, archaeology, ethnography, and the history of science, and applying uh, to his artworks methodologies generally used for pure science. So he's done so many projects, but I think he'll talk about some of them today. Um, Gavin Grindon is uh, an, an art historian and curator who has recently uh, co-curated the exhibition Disobedient Objects at the Victorian Albert Museum in London. Uh, it's an, an incredible exhibition. I, just, I got the, had the pleasure of reading the catalog for it uh, in advance of this talk. Um, and he's going to speak about uh, this project as well as a number of other projects he's been involved with in a more tangential way. And then there's Hans Hake, who of course for many of us needs no introduction, but I'll introduce him anyway. He's a German-American conceptual artist, uh, or say conceptual artist, but artist in so many ways, uh, whose controversial works expose the interconnectivity of culture, politics, corruption, and greed. He's, of course, regarded for many as a kind of forefather or pioneer in the artistic approach that we now call institutional critique. So without further ado, Mark. Yeah. I, you know, I think that was, that was a really kind of perfect summary of some of the issues in institutional critique. And, and I've always felt that there are, um, you know, in, in the most general, I'm being very kind of gross and general now, that two kinds of artists who engage this institutional critique sensibility. One, a group of people who just see the institution, the museum in particular, as being so um, incredibly uh, poisoned and uh, imbued with ideology that it's, it's, it's virtually um, not worth engaging at all. You might as well blow it up. And then I think there's others who really feel like the museum is one of the more salvageable uh, artifacts of the, of the Enlightenment and humanist project that actually has great potential. And they don't want to blow up museums. They want to make more responsible, progressive, democratic, engaging, accessible museums. So they just want to make the museum better. And I would tend to say I'm, I'm in that category, right? And so I want to talk a little bit about just one project in particular and uh, working with one institution, an, an institution that is really amongst natural history museums, one of the juggernauts of natural history museums. Uh, that is the, uh, the, what used to be called the British Museum of Natural History, which now tellingly has changed its name to the Museum of Natural History, which is quite funny. Uh, and so, um, so in 2007, I was invited to, uh, to do a project with, with the um, British Museum of Natural History be, uh, based on the birth date of Linnaeus, right? Let's see if this works. Oh, look at that. Uh, and so uh, the people in, in the British Museum of Natural History were very caught up with the up and coming celebration of the, uh, of the uh, bicentennial of the birth of Darwin and so they were, very, uh, 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 they were very neglectful of the tricentennial of the birth of Linnaeus. So everyone had kind of forgotten about this. And it crept up on them, and they suddenly thought, we have to do something about Linnaeus. Linnaeus didn't leave an enormous amount of material culture uh, after his death. And what he did leave is very much um, preserved in Uppsala in Sweden. Every museum, of course, uh, around the world wanted to do something about Linnaeus's um, birth and his contribution. So they were kind of late in the game. They couldn't get very much material culture. They couldn't, uh, they hadn't really a theme. And what do you do when you're an institution like that and you're totally in crisis, you have no idea what to do, there's great problems discussing uh, your, with your team, you invite an artist to come in. And so uh, 
So they invited me. And, and because of that, if something goes wrong, of course, I take the blame. And if there are holes in the research, I take the blame. And, uh, and if I can't find something, I tend to make it. So there's solutions to the lack of material culture. So I, I, I don't think I need to introduce Linnaeus to you all. So Linnaeus is the um, 18th century Swedish botanist who really develops uh, the, the system of binomial nomenclature, which we all use in naming things, and, and which led, of course, to the kind of uh, system of systematics and taxonomy that we use today. So they invited me to do this project. I wanted to do a project not so much about Linnaeus, although he's kind of interesting, fascinating, weird character, but really about what does systematics mean today, right? So, but in order to do that, as often happens in my projects, I have the burden of having to bring the public up to speed. So I have to talk about what, who Linnaeus is, what taxonomy is, and what systematics is. So one enters this enormous um, gallery, this is called the Jerwood Gallery, and we start with an exhibition that's, that is really about Linnaeus, uh, his contributions as a person, but also Linnaeus as a kind of um, history of science um, pop superstar, right? Linnaeus is one of the few scientists who gets to be uh, in known enormously within the world. This is a bust of him and some of, and uh, surrounded are some of the artifacts that were produced not only by Linnaeus, but also about Linnaeus. These are various um, portraits and pictures coming from his time, from the 18th century, from the 19th century, from the 20th century, very funky 1950s portrait there. Uh, we also are showing Linnaeus's um, uh, herbarium cabinet that exists in London. You know, the L Linnaean Society is in London. The Linnaean Society holds all of the type specimens uh, for, uh, for all of the things that Linnaeus named. Are, when you name an organism, the first one that's named, what is described after is called the type specimen. These are the most valuable things in museums of natural history. This is what, you know, what Vermeer, Vermeers are to art museums, type specimens are to natural history museums. And so, um, uh, after Linnaeus' death, his widow was incredibly broke. She wanted to sell his collection, which would be the most valuable collection of, of type specimens in the world, since he started the system. Everything he named is a type specimen. Uh, to the King of Sweden, he, she wanted to sell it. He was on vacation. Uh, Joseph Banks in England found out about this bought the collection from, um, from his widow, uh, arranged to have it transported. The king came back. He was furious, and he sent warships to intercept Banks' ship. They didn't. And so in a atom bomb-proof bunker under um, the British Academy is a, and down many, many flights of stairs, is a vault. And in that vault are the type specimens of Linnaeus. Uh, so it's an extraordinary thing. But whenever you open the door of the vault, you bang into this cabinet. And I said, what's that cabinet? And they said, oh, well, that's what the things came in. You know, that's what all the, all the herbarium sheets came in. So that wasn't really seen because there is a scientific collection and there's scientists who organize it. That wasn't seen as an object of cultural value or any value. That was just, you know, the box. So we were able to borrow that from them. They had never looked at it before. Anyway, we also, we're the first, this is the first time the, the um, Linnaean Society has ever lent anything for an exhibition outside of the Linnaean Society. So uh, we, sh we tried to show, these are some, um, these are some um, examples of herbarium sheets that existed just before Linnaeus, or at the time of Linnaeus, and the different kinds of models they used before Linnaeus, and the, and the botanists from his time come up with the standard um, presentation, which is very dry. So you see some of these other presentations, it wasn't really the plant until you put an uh, engraving of a flower pot at the bottom of it, or you might paint grass under it, so giving it some kind of naturalistic aspect. We borrowed um, three plants, three herbarium sheets from the Linnaeus collection, um, uh, coca, tobacco, and cannabis. And so that, and these were the first ones that have ever been uh, lent outside. So at this point, we bring people up to um, a discussion of who Linnaeus is, what he did, uh, what his contribution was, what systematics means, what is the culture of collecting. We hope that we, people are brought up to that speed then. And then we start to think about what's, what are some of the debates and discussions in systematics today. And of course, there's a great debate uh, in 2007 at the Museum of Natural History between the um, um, scientists who are engaged in a traditional 
orthodox taxonomy using, uh, using comparative anatomy. So the morphologists who are looking at animals and plants and comparing their parts, which they, we've, they've done that, you know, since before Linnaeus, and the new molecular techniques. So people who are looking uh, genetically at, uh, at what they find. And at this time, there's a lot of discussion about what's called the barcoding of species, in which each species, each animal and plant and or every organism will get a barcode, and that will help us figure out what they are based on a molecular analysis of, of DNA, right? So I wanted to do some experiments around, not, uh, around looking at the city of London as our site. So uh, Linnaeus's project is called System Natura. We created a system uh, metropolis. So um, this is our our venue. So the first of these experiments we did was to use a, a new um, a smart car, and we attached this kind of pizza box device to the roof, and we drove the longest road in London. And attached to that pizza box is a sticky substance which captures every insect which hits our car. So. Um, all of those organisms, we come back, and all of those organisms are very carefully removed from this sticky substrate and divided into two groups, one group given to the molecular biologists and one group given to the people who are going to use comparative anatomy and, uh, and or orthodox uh, uh, techniques. And they have a kind of race to identify what are all of these things that hit this car. And we found, of course, numerous um, species. So uh, they are all processed or um, the uh, results are processed in this lab. And we have the, uh, the um, diagrams of what kinds of things we found, uh, including some surprising discoveries. So for instance, we hit a, um, uh, a beetle uh, from South Africa. And it's the first time this beetle had ever been recorded in, uh, uh, in Britain. Um, another um, thing which really tickled the, uh, uh, the orthodox taxonomist was that some of the, uh, the morphological results came back not so much what the organism was, but rather what the organism had eaten. So one beetle came back as a grain of rice, and we know that it was not a grain of rice. So, so this was just a delight for the, uh, for the morphology team. So, uh, so each of these projects really uses the infrastructure of the city to try to introduce uh, some, some aspects of what systematics might mean today and, and why, why it's important, why it's interesting, why people care. Uh, and also, you know, I mean, in projects like this, you know, I'm, I'm an incredibly privileged person because I see the backs of museums all the time. And when you spend time behind the scenes of the museum, you know that that's where all the sexy stuff is going on. That's where, that's where the museum is really functioning in institutions like this museum or like our, the American Museum here, which are heavily research institutions, which have this incredibly dynamic uh, uh, infrastructure of research and scientists and collections that are being used all this time. And suddenly the front of the house becomes incredibly boring and incredible, I mean, there's, we, we can talk about that later, but there's a great divide between the front and the back of the house in institutions like this. The next site that we looked at was the football um, what, the football pitch, the football field, the, the soccer field, that was about to be destroyed to make the new soccer field for the Olympics. So, um, so we removed a, 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 a meter sample of that, and we removed a meter sample from the outside, uh, the edge of the parking lot of the soccer stadium that was going to be destroyed to make the new soccer stadium for the Olympics. Uh, needless to say, this is not what you would consider a um, a very special endangered environment that needs to be assessed before. But even in this, um, in this small area that would be replaced with, a, uh, with an artificial turf, there were some interesting things. So we put the two, side, the two specimens side by side and created also a herbarium and also uh, discovered what were the species uh, in these two samples which were allowed to kind of grow. And, this was a very difficult thing to do because the Museum of Natural History does not allow living organisms in the public spaces of the museum. Uh, so uh, this, this, this took a lot of convincing. So this is the, the example of the soccer stadium grass, which is basically two species of grass that exist. And then this is the parking lot uh, specimen, which of course has a greater um, uh, biological diversity, not surprisingly. 
so I worked with obviously various departments. So one of the departments I worked with, uh, one of my favorite departments was the invertebrate, um, uh, invertebrate um, species department. And so we worked with um, invertebrate bio biologists looking at three different cemeteries in London and the graves of three different um, social reformers. So this is the grave of Emily Pankhurst, who was a suffragette, a blue stocking, uh, an incredibly um, um, wonderful writer and, uh, and social activist. This, of course, is the grave of Karl Marx. We collected every living thing we could find in, on, and around the grave sites. And this is the grave of, of Huxley. Uh, and Thomas Huxley, uh, the, you know, so-called Darwin's bulldog, uh, great proponent of, of uh, education for everyone and also a great proponent of evolution. So we collected um, worms and, uh, and arthropods and, uh, and pretty much everything we could possibly find. You might, well, I'll tell you who, who got the most uh, specimens. And then we laid everything out. These are our discoveries, the various um, um, species that exist on these graves, uh, a comparison of the, uh, of the diversity. I believe that it was, um, it's Huxley at the Finchley Cemetery, which had the most organisms, largely because Huxley is buried under an oak tree, and oak trees have incredible diversity of things that are supported by them. This, of course, um, it tells us absolutely nothing uh, about the social reformers, tells us very little about the biotic communities that might live there. And uh, so this is really about taking the, uh, the sort of guise, uh, in some way, a shadowing the methodology of how one collects. It was about, in some way, reconnecting the um, scientists who work in the basements, who largely work now with molecular um, information, and reconnecting them with their kind of passion for field collecting, uh, which, which they all had. And this was a kind of an extraordinary couple of days working with some of the uh, world's greatest experts on things like centipedes and beetles and, uh, and snails and uh, spending time with them in this kind of uh, strange outing looking at these social reformers' tombs. Each one of these uh, Installations also is accompanied by a video that shows the process. And then these are some of the, uh, this is one of the photographs you produce one of the organisms. Um, the last of these projects was cleaning the intake valve for the Thames power station. So the Thames power station, of course, takes river water from the Thames, uses that to cool down the turbines uh, we collected every single thing we could from that, which included both um, cultural and natural objects, and we processed them in this biohazard polytunnel. Um, so you could never really get a very clear um, sense of what was there, uh, but there's one kind of open window, and you see through that the vast amount of material culture that, uh, that accumulates uh, in something like this. Obviously, lots of things that are very lightweight, like styrofoam, but also organisms. There were you know, uh, dozens and dozens of eels, pipefish. Um, we found only the second only recorded seahorse that's ever been found in the Thames. Um, uh, leopard shark, a whole variety of things, um, including um, uh, some um, or organization had done a fundraiser with rubber ducks a rubber duck race to raise money. So in a way, all of these projects very much emphasize this idea that, uh, that it's, it's very difficult to tease out um, and to just look at the city as a, as a natural space, as a space which does not have in some way uh, a, an overlay of, of culture as part of it. Um, like in many of my projects, there's also a handbook that goes with it, based very much on the kind of model of of field guides and things like that. And I brought some of these if, if anyone's interested in taking one. Um, anyway, so this is, this is for me one example of what I think about as a kind of productive model of how one collaborates with, with an institution, how one kind of takes an institution that is, is fraught in many ways with um, a history of mistakes, uh, with some um, still um, public policy issues, with um, design flaws that are just 
traumatic for someone who loves museums and tries to do something productive and, and exciting. So thanks. this window as well. Oh look, there's another one behind it. This is great. This is a fun game. Okay, wow, this, this is a busy computer. Okay. Right. Oh, thanks. Close. Okay, where is it? There we go. Sweet. Thank you. Hello. Um, my talk... Oh, we've got to start the thing up, start the thing up. So my talk's kind of in... Th it's, a, it's a bit all over the place. It's in three kind of bits. The first bit is a theory bit but I promise it will be short and hopefully painless. Um, okay, discussions of uh, institutional critique uh, have tended to be, have tended to typify critique as something that comes from without upon the institution. Uh, and that's kind of the situation Andrea Fraser engages with in her 2005 essay, uh, from the critique of institutions to an institution of critique. Um, that you're talking about. She, she kind of wrestles with the issue of what happens when institutional critique has become institutionalized, uh, when, as you're saying, we are the institution. And that's kind of the line that I want to follow, um, but maybe but in a different direction, not in such a melancholy way, like being the institution is not necessarily such a bad thing. Um, and it's often argued that there are, art historians like to say there are two stages of institutional critique. There's some stuff happening in the 70s and then the late 80s and the 90s. And I'm going to posit that there's something else going on now, maybe since about 2000. Um, that takes a different sort of tack. And so a lot of the historical, art historical writing, so this is about perspectives on uh, these different practices we call institutional critique, depend on particular suppositions about the role of critique and about how power works in a society. Um, and one of the key contexts for the, for the historicization of institutional critique is academic Western Marxism. Um, for example, Peter Berger's uh, Theory of the Avant-Garde, it's a horrible book, uh, which is published in English in 1984, as artists like Fraser are framing their understanding uh, of these critical artists uh, as, as institutional critique. And lots of historians in that period are engaging with his, his writing in his terms, even if it's just kind of to disagree with him a lot. Um, and this, this tradition, this Western Marxist tradition, and I'm speaking kind of quite sympathetically to, uh, to it, I'm not, I'm not kind of attacking it, uh, places tradition, places uh, critique critique of ideology in a primary position. It's through critique, critique that power is unveiled uh, and can be attacked. Um, but at the same time, uh, as this approach is becoming canonical in the academy, you can find another perspective uh, outside of the university that has a very different relationship um, to what critique is for. And this is that space of general intellect that uh, Stefano Hani and Fred Moten called the undercommons. Um, alongside the critique of institutions, there are also social movement organizations, which are, which are also institutions, or rather, uh, they're the emergence and formation of new institutions. Um, so it's important, I think, to place critiques of power, very broadly political critiques, uh, artistic practices, uh, alongside the already existing counterpower of activist social movements, whose direct action and prefrogative politics uh, present their own forms of general intellect, their own forms of knowledge and understanding, um, and their own infrastructures, their own institutional formations, um, already challenging and modifying established forms of life. So within Western social movements, there's been an increasing shift towards direct action and prefigurative politics, towards emphasizing counterpower and its role. Um, that's what Hart and Negri in their, their bumper book of radical theory uh, describe in their writing uh, when they talk about how battalion state constitutions are movements' powers to reconstitute social relations. They, they use this term constituent power, but we could easily say instituent power, uh, the political composition of new institutions. And critique has a different role in, in this situation. Um, speaking truth to power is really important, but it isn't enough. Uh, instead, critique is informed by and proceeds from movement. So critique becomes 
one way of thinking new possibilities and opportunities to extend and enable actually existing agency, which is already uh, changing institutions and building new ones within and outside of them. Um, and I think you can find an approach that, that adopts this sort of perspective in more recent artistic practices, which both uh, look critically at systems or ecologies within and around art institutions, but to also uh, principally connect with the instituent power of social movements. Um, and as long as this connection to counter power is maintained, as long as this work remains active within a network of counter power, it becomes more possible to work uh, critically and productively within our institutions, I think. Uh, rather than institutions necessarily, and this is always, I think, a crude reading, reifying or recuperating those practices. Um, and maintaining a, a connection to institutional power, it's a, it's a hard thing to do. Um, but it means that radical arts practice inside a museum uh, means something, something different and provides some interesting possibilities. Um, and it's, a, it's an approach that I think forces a museum, for example, to function as a public place, space and test the limits of what and who the museums are for. Um, and this means rather than a dynamic of critique and recuperation, these practices meet the art institution as only one organisational base of support among others, which could include NGOs, the infrastructures of grassroots movements, um, and maybe another example of this, this kind of instituent practice that I'm thinking of that's completely outside of museums is um, uh, in, in the 1970s people begin climbing up trees and sitting in them, in, first in New Zealand, uh, then in Australia it spreads around the world as a tactic to uh, halt the cutting of forests. Um, along with banner drops, uh, tripod barricades, other forms of climbing become really important um, to ecological protest cultures. Um, and ecological activists develop bases of support within sports climbing businesses and associations. Uh, rope access firms are often employed by the police to get rid of them, to get them out of the tree so they can cut the tree down. Uh, and they would be people who the climbers knew because they're both buying their gear in the same shop. Uh, and this, this divides the institute. The climbing community is relatively new. Most of these people who are doing protest climbing are doing it because climbing only becomes a sport and in the early 80s. Uh, Mostly at universities, they start building climbing walls in this period. Um, so when Greenpeace climbers went up the Shard last year, this is a very tall, flashy, glass, shiny new building in London, um, the British Mountaineering Association, uh, in a gesture of support, this is their website that you can see, announced uh, it as an official route on their website, um, which I particularly, <laughs> what I particularly like is rock type other. <laughs> <laughs> So I think these bases of, of, of external support uh, act as kind of potential bulwarks against recuperation by art institutions necessarily, um, but they also more powerfully force an organisational divide, as they have with the, the British Climbing Association, within the museum's own contradictions between its public mission um, and its private or commercial interests. So people started sticking these stickers up inside the show I'm going to talk about in a moment um, at the Victorian Albert Museum. Um, so this perspective I'm sketching out, another similar one, such as Jean Ranger Rownig's book that you, I think you were pointing towards, Reinventing Institutional Critique, I think are really reflecting on a very specific set of practices from around 2000 onwards, um, which join art and direct action. Uh, and these sorts of practices have existed outside art institutions since, since at least the 1960s, um, with, I guess here in New York, uh, groups, I've just written an article about the history of Black Mask and the Motherfuckers, um, I think are kind of seminal here, but they're very much outside of the canon that until recently outside of art institutions or histories. Um, but around 2000, some of these groups in this tradition begin to find marginal supports within the institutional art world, uh, and making use of the kind of discursive space opened up by institutional critique. Uh, I think the key moment for that is uh, MACBA in Barcelona uh, in 2000. They have a program called On Direct Action, considered as one of the fine arts, which brought artists and others working collectively within various aspects of the anti-globalization movement in Europe, doing kind of interesting experimental creative things to collaborate together in a museum context. That, um, yeah, I've, I, that did end with riot police storming through the museum, so it's maybe not the best uh, positive story to tell. Um, so, part two. So, uh, the exhibition I recently co-curated in London at the Victorian Albert Museum uh, attempted to frame some of these ideas in broad terms. And uh, if you're following this kind of thing, there have been a, a series of exhibitions in Europe over the last few years themed around activism. Activism, activism, sexy. Who doesn't who doesn't want to be considered an activist? What's the I mean? What's the opposite of that? I just I lie at home and I just sort of drink cider and masturbate. Um, <laughs> that, not me. I don't. I never do that. Um, <laughs> so where movements uh, are represented in a lot of these ex exhibitions, they don't necessarily have much curatorial control. 
Uh, so the Berlin Biennial in 2012 is probably the most recent famous example of that. Um, but there are plenty of others, so the 2009 Istanbul Biennial, uh, whose curators were criticized by the org organizers of Resistanbul, which is a terrible pun, um, but they were organizing mass protests against the IMF summit in the city that was happening at the same time. And they criticized uh, the Biennial organs for not connecting with them. Um, in 2013, there were protests against public alchemy, uh, the next Istanbul Biennial, um, sponsored by the uh, Turkish conglomerate Cock Holdings, uh, for, and this is the words of, uh, for released by the activists, pretending to have a public discourse while at the same time stifling protest against the, the museum sponsorship. Um, and the curators, I think pretty unwisely, accused the protesters of psychological violence, which is kind of mean. Um, and it kind of backfired. So two weeks later, the Gezi Park protest erupted in Istanbul um, and built up, and this is kind of, I guess, an example of what I'm talking about, built up a, a certain sort of amount of counterpower that was, again, embarrassing for this publicly engaged uh, art exhibition. Um, some of the participants then began to change their tone, change their practice, and try and engage with stuff that was going on elsewhere in the city. Um, and disobedient objects, these are a couple of installation shots, very slick looking, uh, were intended curatorially to re-exhibit some of this work, um, which has found its way into the art world, but solidly framed in the context of social movement organizations within and against the institutional formations of things like design activism, uh, activist art or craftivism. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so we tried to find ways to enable... Uh, this is that's going to be nice and silent, that's good. Uh, to enable movement cultures to be exhibited in their own terms. Um, it's really an exhibition about the context and infrastructures of protests. It uses material props, the, ob you know, the disobedient objects, which is one of the least preserved and least examined aspects of movement cultures, the things of the material culture of movements, um, to explore the systems of counterpower which prop up a movement. And, and there's an interesting there's a kind of museum story in that. Museums collect political posters. That's, if you go to the, you want the radical movement stuff in, an ex, in a museum, you go to the Prince Department. Um, there are historical reasons for that. People again collecting posters. Uh, in the late 19th century, they're an exciting public medium. They also happen to be something that uh, social movements use, so they kind of slip under the door. Um, the textile department of a museum pretty rarely will collect political banners, even though there's a great tradition of that in the UK. Um, and the furniture department will, hasn't, uh, the V&A hasn't collected any barricades, um, <laughs> we asked. So we opened the curation in a series of several workshops with the people who are lending us objects, often from very current movements. Um, or who'd been involved in the movements that were being represented decide on the themes and the structure of the show as well as its physical design. Um, so the idea was that unlike other recent activist theme shows, not to separate the representation of movements from their instituent power. Uh, and there are precedents to this in stuff like the, the work of like, group material in the 1980s, uh, or especially some museums' engagements with indigenous communities um, on organizing and curatorial boards where objects taken from those cultures can be re-exhibited uh, back in their own terms and returned for, to, for example, religious uh, use in their original communities. Um, so the outcomes of this uh, were things like highly visible wall text written by the makers, so these, this yellow text, or users of each object, which the, we got the museum to agree not to censor. Um, How-to guides for many of the objects showing how to reproduce them. Um, revising the museum's rules on casing and insurance and conservation, that was the hardest, the hardest part, to make the objects kind of physically touchable. Uh, or deferring kind of collectible, authentic original objects with the use of contextual images, design plans to make your own, or replicas in, the pla in their place. Um, we displayed DIY gas mask designs from the Gezi Park protests in Istanbul uh, and Greek solutions for how to treat yourself uh, with tear gas. Um, so there's, there's two bottles that you can see there. Um, the first one, Marlox, it's like an, an antacid that you use. People used to use vinegar and lemon juice, um, but that works better, except you, you spray the solution on your face, it alleviates the stinging sensation, but it paints your face white, which is not a great way to walk out of a demonstration as like everyone is marked out like who was, who was on the demo. Um, so Greek protesters discovered that Riopan, the small sachet you can see next to it, which is like an oral gel for the same purpose, didn't leave a, res a residue. So there's kind of, we're occupying the space of like a design history to talk about the strategies that people use um, to resist power. So uh, these, the online, we put these guides online, you could tear them away to these yellow things, pull them off the wall in the exhibition and take them away with you, some, go home and make some of those things. You could download them. And they became a point, maybe, of political 
uh, tr of transmission from one on under commons for another. You see that it being tweeted here uh, and people saying that they were make, using these guides in Ferguson recently in the demonstrations there. Uh, meanwhile, workshops at the museum to produce inflatable carbon bubbles uh, and book block shields to produce props that are going to be used uh, in the upcoming climate march in London. Um, and many of the objects go back to their makers to be used again after the exhibition. Um, people who will have seen these things first in the museum, up close in the intimate, you know, the, the kind of space that only an exhibition provides to get close to something, to really feel its texture. We'll see them again, mediated in the way that they're normally seeing them, on the news or in the streets. Uh, and the show hopefully produces a space for kind of productive refl reflection grounded in the collective concerns of the movements themselves. So I'm going to briefly talk now quickly about one last project, uh, Liberate Tate. Oh, I'm going, I'm going on too far. You're getting a, you're getting a, there we go. Oh, you can look at that. Um, so let me, yeah, Liberate Tate. Liberate Tate said they're happy for me to speak as a representative of their group, uh, but they haven't, I don't feel like I've done enough organizing with them to, to claim that. So maybe you could say I was like an, an embedded art historian, which sounds quite exciting, <laughs> or a participant observer, which sounds more academic. Take your pick. Um, so the group was formed in 2010 uh, when a collective, the Laboratory of Insurrectionary Imagination, who I've been involved with for a while, um, but I wasn't at this workshop, were invited to organize a workshop at Tate Modern titled Disobedience Makes History. Um, but they were given one instruction. Um, and it, and they, the, tape, the tape printed out the instruction in, in a letter, which was stupid of them, <laughs> saying they must not criticize any of the Tate sponsors, which include the oil company British Petroleum. Um, so they projected the letter on the wall and asked the workshop participants if they should disobey the only instruction they'd been given. And so the group Liberate Tate were formed. Um, to put pressure on the tape regarding its oil sponsorship, firstly through a series of performances, like this one that you can see here, um, within the museum, beginning in June 2010. Oh, here are a few of those, few of those different performances happening. Maybe come back to that. Uh, in June 2010, with an oil spill inside, the summer party held privately at Tate Britain to celebrate 20 years of BP sponsorship. The party coincided with BP's spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, the performances have included uh, things like carrying a block of ice from the Arctic into the museum uh, gallery to melt, to multiple live stream performers online uh, with cameras attached to their faces, whispering the transcripts of the Deepwater Horizon trial in New Orleans while wandering the galleries every day during the week of the trial. Uh, they've been covered in art journals, but they've also been on the front page of the Financial Times and other newspapers. And Tate sponsorship kind of represents a strategic leverage point. So this is what I'm talking about, this uh, link to uh, institutional critique practices and the counterpower outside of a museum. Um, so Tate, uh, a, a leverage point when it comes to the image and acceptability of the fossil fuels industry more generally. Uh, BP Brand, many large cultural institutions in London. Uh, an ex-BP CEO, Lord Brown, you can see him up there, sits on Tate's board of trustees who also decide on their sponsorship program. Um, he, he immediately came to the Tate after having worked at BP since he was 17 years old and describes BP as his family. Um, but this is only one part of a wider carbon web in which oil runs through every sector of our society. London is one of the global centres of the oil industry. BP's cultural presence is just one way in which the oil companies use the city to extract a combination of financial, political, legal, and technological services that enable them to produce, pump, transport, refine, and sell oil and gas. Their branding and tape creates a social license to operate. Uh, so this term, social license to operate, the era of public acceptability, which is as necessary to the business uh, as to their deals and legal permissions they obtain elsewhere. Uh, the dwindling of such a social license is the reason that tobacco sponsorship of the arts is no longer seen as acceptable. The John Player uh, Cigarette Band Portrait Award in the UK is now the BP Portrait Award. Liberate Tate's aim, strategically bound to ecological movements in the UK more broadly, is to push oil sponsorship in this same direction. So point 4.1b of Tate's ethics policy states that Tate will not accept funds when, and quote, the donor has acted or is believed to have acted illegally in the acquisition of funds, for example, when funds are tainted through being the proceeds of criminal conduct. In November 2012, BP agreed to pay a record $4 billion settlement for criminal charges 
regarding the Deepwater Horizon spill. It pleaded guilty to 11 felony counts relating to the deaths of the 11 workers aboard the rig, two misdemeanors, and another felony count of obstruction of Congress. Liberate Tate's performance don't occur in isolation, but part of a network of social movement and radical art groups, the Art Not Oil Network, comprising both other similar groups, the Reclaim Shakespeare Company, Shell Out Sounds, uh, as well as NGOs such as platform activist groups, such as Rising Tide or the UK Tar Sands Network. Um, but artist participation is really fundamental. Um, and other challenges to oil sponsorship have spread uh, to Norway, Ireland, Australia, Canada, Brazil. Um, Liberate Tate's most dramatic performance, which hopefully you're going to be able to see a little bit here, uh, was to carry in and assemble a 16.5 metre, 1.5 tonne wind turbine blade <laughs> inside the Tate Modern's iconic turbine hall space. And this also followed artists, this, we often kind of try and reflect on things that Tate are doing, so this followed artist Fiona Banner's exhibition uh, of the wings and complete uh, fuselages of decommissioned fighter planes in Tate, Britain. So when the police arrived, as they will in a minute in this video, uh, Liberate Tate informed that the artwork, called The Gift, was submitted to be part of Tate's permanent collection as a gift to the nation, pursuant to the 1992 Museums and Gallery Act, given for the benefit of the public. Um, so this 1992 act is one which Tate, from which Tate's mission is drawn. Um, Tate's trustees, uh, according to this act, are legally obliged to keep the gift and formally consider it for their permanent collection, <laughs> which, after their board meeting three months later, they declined to do. So the debate on BP sponsorship centres on how much museums get uh, and whether that could come from somewhere else. Um, from the figures that we have available, uh, BP sponsorship is a really tiny amount uh, compared to the central funding stream that comes from the state uh, and visitor membership and ticket sales. Over the last three years, Tate has been subject to multiple Freedom of Information Act requests uh, over how much funding they receive from BP and the contents, uh, the minutes of meetings where their funding with BP has been renewed. Uh, where other museums, the Natural History Museum, uh, Victoria and Albert, so on, supplied this information in a matter of weeks, Tate's board have consistently presented redacted documents. <laughs> uh, where did I have lost my place? Okay, so last weekend, so this is, this is super recent now, we're up to the present, Liberate Tate conducted a new performance, uh, Hidden Figures, in the Turbine Hall, responding to the Tate Board's refusal of accountability, you can see some photos of it here, uh, and to Tate's latest exhibition, Malevich, Revolutionary of Russian Art, uh, whose famous black square painting, covering up some human figures, uh, represented, of course, the turning point in modern art. So in March 2014, earlier this year, the UK Government Information Commissioner ruled that the Tate was breaking information law on several counts by refusing to remove redactions from the minutes they had provided. Tate appealed the ruling and now will appear before a court in an oral hearing to explain their behaviour this coming Thursday, the 18th of September. So uh, keep an eye out for that and we'll see that they say for themselves. Thanks very much. I very much enjoyed uh, uh, what the speakers that preceded me have said, and I was very much taken by what Steve had to say about uh, the history of so-called institutional critique and how to uh, handle it today, or what to do with it. Uh, I'm not familiar with the uh, specific uh, subject of natural history museums and their involvement. I'm uh, more uh, in the history of art museums and occasionally I have uh, uh, responded to what I saw with an occasional uh, problem that I ran into, uh, which is normal. Uh, and uh, very recently, 
uh, as a matter of fact, I was probably, I cannot quite tell what it was, uh, indirectly censored by an art magazine. Uh, I was asked by Apollo, uh, a very venerable uh, art historical magazine, to respond to a question. They apparently have uh, the, uh, uh, the habit to uh, juxtapose uh, uh, two opinions. Uh, uh, and I was asked to uh, respond to the question as they phrased it, does corporate sponsorship tarnish public museums? And I submitted my answer uh, on time and within the numbers of words uh, that I was uh, uh, given. And I never heard a word from them again. Now, I, don't, and I inquired whether they had received it. I also didn't get an answer to that. So I don't know what really happened, but uh, I suspect that uh, what I wrote uh, was not quite to their liking. And so uh, you would be the first audience to, uh, for my thing. And it is uh, my attempt to answer the question, does corporate sponsorship tarnish public museums? While my answer to this question is an unequivocal yes, I have to qualify it as being valid only in democratic societies. Whether public institutions, given today's financial and political constraints, can avoid or contain the negative consequences of corporate sponsorship cannot be answered generic, uh, generally. It requires examining the particular circumstances under which a given institution operates. Public museums are to serve the public good. Taxpayers finance them to pre perform that task. Corporations, on the other hand, pursue private interests for the financial gain of their owners or shareholders. Museums in the US have been financed predominantly by private contributions. Over the past 50 years, they have also attracted corporate sponsors, particularly for programs that promise media recognition and blockbuster attendance. Due to the tax deductibility of sponsorship monies as business expenses, taxpayers, in effect, cover the shortfall of tax revenues or live with cuts in public services. This mixed and confusing model of funding has been imported to Europe. It's written for a European, primarily European audience, I suppose, with Apollo. Driving the import was the need, uh, driving the import was the need or ambition to add costly new programs to the offerings of European museums. But it also relieved financial pressures. Even governmental authorities failed to increase public uh, when governmental authorities failed uh, to increase public funding, or worse, cut budgets. Corporate sponsorship appeared to be a way out. The shortfall of tax revenue due to the tax deductibility of sponsorship monies was overlooked, and politicians got used to basking in the glamour of crowd-pleasing exhibitions. Reducing its tax bill is only one aspect of a corporation's strategy of giving money to the arts. David Rockefeller, former chairman of the Museum of Modern Art and chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank, knows both sides intimately. In 1966, a time when, quote, public relations was not yet a standard term in the business vocabulary he said, now a quote, from an economic standpoint, such involvement in the arts can mean direct and tangible benefits. It can provide a company with extensive publicity and advertising, a brighter public reputation, and an improved corporate image. 
It can build better customer relations, a readier acceptance of company products, and a superior appraisal of their quality. And he concluded, even accountants put a money value on such intangibles as goodwill. For decades, banks have been conspicuous corporate sponsors. Lately, the logos of Deutsche Bank and UBS have been prominently displayed in New York museums. Last year's Whitney Biennial was sponsored by Deutsche Bank, and the Guggenheim, after many years of collaboration with the German bank, has signed up with UBS. UBS, of course, is also the sponsor of the art Basel and the art fairs in Miami Beach and Shanghai. While Deutsche Bank sponsors Freeze and Art Hong Kong, ventures that connect and expand in relations with wealthy, uh, expand, that connect and expand its relations with wealthy clients. Both banks were investigated by US authorities. Deutsche Bank, because of practices that contributed to the crash of 2008, and UBS for knowingly assisting US taxpayers to evade taxes. The aura of the good, the true, and the beautiful associated with art is to polish their image. In the words of Gordon Pell, deputy chairman of Coots, the Royal Bank of Scotland, bankers could do with any reflected glory we can get. <laughs> or, as Dominique uh, Perrier, for 20 years the president of Cartier and former head of Admical, the Association pour le Développement du Mécénat Industriel et Commercial, put it, art sponsorship is not just a tremendous tool of corporate communication, it is more than that. It is a tool for the seduction of public opinion. At the time when the US Secretary of Health declared that 400,000 deaths a year can be attributed to smoking-related diseases, exhibitions in every art museum of New York were sponsored by Philip Morris. George Weissman, chairman of the company's executive committee, explained the rationale. Let's be clear about one thing. Our fundamental interest in the arts is self-interest. There are immediate and pragmatic benefits to be derived as business entities. Oil companies have long, a long history of sponsoring art exhibitions. Following Mobile's example, before and after the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, BP has been a prominent art sponsor. Mobile's manager of public relations once declared, we aimed at the movers and shakers in many fields, including businessmen, city and state officials, the media. A colleague at his sister company expressed the same in metaphoric terms. Exxon's support of the arts serves the arts as a social lubricant. A former president of the Metropolitan Museum had this to say. To a large degree, we have accepted a certain principle about funding that in passing through our illustrious hall, the money is cleansed. Speaking about another part of the equation, Philippe de Montebello, recent director of the museum, added, it's an inherent, insidious, hidden form of censorship. We censor ourselves every day. What is the bottom line? One, corporate sponsorship yields political results favorable to the sponsor. And two, it filters out programs critical of the business world. Both goals are unwittingly subsidized by taxpayers. And Apollo can't take it. <laughs> now, the, uh, as we heard uh, uh, during the introduction, uh, of course, there is uh, news uh, in New York uh, uh, at the Metropolitan Museum uh, David Koch, uh, one of uh, the two uh, Koch brothers, uh, a major funder of uh, 
uh, the Republican Party and uh, uh, the gridlock uh, in Washington uh, funded uh, the, uh, the f a plaza that was opened on Wednesday uh, and uh, now the, uh, the, uh, the fountains are going in front of uh, uh, the Met with his name engraved into the marble encasement. Uh, to follow up on uh, something that uh, Steve said, there was, uh, I, I read something this morning in the New York Times that uh, um, may uh, matter and that uh, in effect surprised me a, a bit, but it was good news. Uh, I read that uh, the uh, 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 Miss, uh, uh, what's her name? Teach, teach all. Or, or teach out. Teach out. Yes, yes. So if you teach out, who was challenging uh, Mario Cuomo uh, for the governorship of uh, uh, New York State, uh, got a remarkable thirty percent of the vote during the primary last week, and. And this is perhaps uh, a, uh, something we should uh, consider as a, a, a worthwhile in, in practical terms. Uh, in several New York City, Manhattan neighborhoods, particularly in, on the west side in Uptown and Greenwich Village down to Tribeca, she got 60% of uh, the district, and that's remarkable. And so uh, th these are pretty well-to-do neighborhoods. And if uh, oppositional uh, 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 policies uh, introduced uh, through uh, exhibitions and museums or activities at museums, uh, it is not a lost cause. It is not, uh, as I sometimes hear from uh, friends and colleagues, uh, forget about the museums. There is an audience that uh, might indeed be receptive, and that could have political consequences. Thank you. So I'm going to invite our speakers and facilitator Steve onto the stage um, and invite y'all to lob questions in their direction. We'll start a discussion. Kick us off. Um, I can start us off. Um, something that's been well, I did I did a little bit of thinking about uh, the way this panel would fit together and and really what everyone brings to it. And I thought that something that was quite interesting to me is the way that the division uh, between the museum and whatever exceeds the museum is really activated in what you're talking about in, in each case. So whether it be um, the museum and big business uh, and corporate sponsorship and the way that uh, the corporate world enters into the museum, uh, complicating that strict division between the museum and, and that which exceeds. Um, or uh, the tr bringing of uh, uh, sort of the everyday world, you know, in the case of Mark's work, um, into the museum through using the, the means of uh, uh, field work, um, or the standard, the standard kind of uh, 
uh, protocols of the, of the museum. Um, and something that I was really interested in is, is, is the way that uh, this division is, is so porous, in fact. And something that institutional critique does is actually it, uh, or the way that I see it working in the, in the various practices that you're talking about, is it's investigating this sort of porous border between the museum uh, as a public space and these things that are infringing on it, and, but also the, these, these possibilities for intervention within it from outside. So I wonder if maybe we can get started by just talking a little bit about, about the kind of divide between the museum and that which exceeds it, um, and see if maybe that'll start things up. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the goals of, of all of us and, and everyone under the rubric of institutional critique, whether that's um, old school or new school or whatever, I think that, that you know, is, is that, uh, you know, is, is this kind of deep suspicion that the museum uh, uh, should not ever be presented as, as, as natural, right? It, it presents itself as authoritative, as natural, as making these arguments without uh, any sense of, of uh, a discussion of how things are made, what things mean, choices that are made. So I think a lot of, and, and of course, how things are paid for. So I think a big part of our effort really is to be able to make that much more transparent and much more something something that, that can be talked about. And so, and something that um, is also uh, reflexive onto um, um, exhibition design, onto I how ideas are formed, how ideas are presented, all of those aspects have to be much more foreground. In, um, and I, I think that's what all of the generations of institutional critics share. Yeah, I think, I think that's the case. Like, I was, no, as you were talking, I was just trying to think about a question of measure as well, of like, how, like with your projects, how do you, when, when they've happened, how do, you, how do you measure them? Like, what, when do you know it's one, or when do you feel like it's one that's good? Or like, that's, you know, like that it's, it's done that, what you've just described? I mean, I, mean, I think it's, yeah, it's quite difficult, but I, th I think that, um, you know, I see every time I enter into a collaboration with an institution, and, and my work is very much always collaborating with the institution, and that's why I think I see the institution in a very broad way. I also see it as, a, as a, an invitation to a gambling table, and I'm not always sure if I'm going to win or lose, you know, and I, and I try, uh, you know, I only play the games where I think I have a an edge, and that the, there's a, a, you know, that I have a more of a, more of the odds are in my favor. But there are times, absolutely, where I feel like uh, I ended up um, instrumentalized rather than uh, really doing something that pushes the institution. Yeah, I mean, it certainly, it, oh, that was loud. I uh, felt like that, with, like, disobe that was, disobedient objects was really terrifying to try and do because I felt like I felt very accountable to all of the people who'd given me their stuff and were telling their stories, mm -hmm. and I felt very suspicious of, like, it's the Victorian Albert yeah, Museum. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's, and which is, but that turned out to be one of the weird things. I think that was really interesting uh, when you talk about the museum not being, uh, like, monolithic, that I've done a project previously at the Tate, uh, at their invitation, so not a Liberate Tate thing, um, which, uh, which, uh, not an alternative came to which the Tate censored. Like they directly got involved and said, "Well, this can't happen and that can't happen," and it was it was on very political grounds. There were groups they didn't want involved. Um, so I kind of came to the V&A super suspicious. But then I realised that a lot of, and I guess maybe this has been both of your experiences. Like what you can get away with, kind of depends on the individuals that you deal with, rather than some particular monolithic structure. Um, so someone in a particular department. Uh, so the V&A is very supportive, does a lot of work, like gives you space, and, and would made things possible for us that we wouldn't have other, otherwise been able to do. Um, whereas perhaps one of the other departmental heads went away, and I heard, gave a talk to her department that we must not let communists take over our museum. <laughs> <laughs> and we got less support. Uh, and, and, but it made, it made me realize, and even sit, I got to sit in on a couple of trustees meetings as well, and have a little glimpse like, firsthand about how they were making their funding decisions. And you got this picture that was about their friends and who they knew and who they could get to come around to dinner. And it was a very closed world. Um, and the, this, I'd come in with a very kind of strong structural analysis of like, oh, this has happened. Some of that seemed to fall away, like that the, the institution was kind of, it was bits and pieces. Yeah, and, but I think, you know, there's this generation of younger people who are working at these institutions who have read the same books that we've read and share 
the values that we, which is, I think, not true when I started working with museums 25 years ago. But now there's a, a generation of very sophisticated people who may not have the most powerful roles in those museums, but they're looking for ways to speak to these ideas, and we are kind of instruments to do that. So what, what you're saying is I'm encouraging like industrial sabotage within the museum. That's, 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 but I'm fine with that, that. That, that's how I think about it, very much so, yeah. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, uh, the the staff of uh, museums is not monolithic. They are not all corporate uh, corporate uh, uh, servants, uh, knowingly or unknowingly. Uh, there is one aspect that makes me occasionally uh, worried, and I have to play it uh, really. Uh, case by case. Uh, I know in a, a number of instances that uh, somebody in the museum would love to do something that uh, uh, in effect is along my lines of, of thinking, but knows through experience that it, it dangers her or his future in that institution and potentially also in other institutions. And I think uh, that is an, uh, uh, something that we have to consider as well. Yeah, and I, well I think that that's where, I mean I think that's largely why we get invited sometimes, yeah. is because when things do get sticky, it, the blame falls on us in a way. And, and I think that that, you know, in a way the institution escapes in some sense because they don't have to claim responsibility for voice, right? They can say, well, it was just as hard as we invited them in and they did this. At the same time, I think that if we are forceful and the exhibitions are, um, are well researched and productive, we really can be that voice of that dissident group within the institution. And I, and I really think a lot of institutions have very strong dissident groups within them uh, who are also afraid of, to, they want to keep their jobs too. And they want to wait out the time when they are in more authoritative roles within the institution as well. So what you know what really um, kind of distressed me was your last comment, like you've, sp you've spoken to some of your friends and they say, well, forget the museums. No. I mean, I think that that's, I really think that museums are one of the most powerful ways of knowing. And, uh, you know, I think that they're certainly worth fighting for, you know. I, I don't want to get rid of museums. I just want better museums, more um, progressive and responsible museums. No, it's, uh, I don't remember who said it. Uh, a museum uh, gives visibility to what you have to say. Mm -hmm. No question about it. And that's actually uh, another thing that really strikes me. Um, actually, and it's a good comparison in some ways between uh, what you're just, uh, Gavin's describing about Liberate Tate, um, using the Tate Turbine Hall as a platform for visibility uh, in order to get The Guardian to get hyperallergenic, whatever, all of these uh, sort of more, more mainstream or visible uh, newspapers to actually print their, their stories. Um, and uh, the way that institutions provide a platform, and this I think draws a connection to the platform that Hans just used to actually disclose a censored document, or at least that's how you, you framed it, your uh, response to the, uh, to the magazine interview, or the, the magazine issue on, uh, on corporate sponsorship and using this platform, which is a supportive platform for dissident voices, uh, it, it provides a, a little bit of visibility, not the same as a, a mass distributed magazine, um, but I think that that's something really interesting to think about is how museums are important because they provide a platform and a platform for visibility for different voices, but specifically for you know, uh, progressive or dissident voices. Go ahead. The, uh, I was really struck by the Maxine Wolf quote um, about the. Sorry, Dan. Let me get yeah. you. Up. Thank you. Uh, my name is Daniel Latore, and I was really struck by the Maxine Wolf quote and the idea of gathering bugs, you know, in the city, and then also uh, some of the prior work, Hans, that you did of like the uh, slumlord, you know. Uh, documentation. So what I've been hearing in 
other conversations is the importance of, uh, or the fact that a lot of museums or institutions aren't working in a place-based manner. They're sort of as if they're on an alien planet and there's no contextual social relationship with the neighborhood they're in. Um, as an example, the, the new museum asked me to be an advisor to some startup lab that they're doing. And I said, I'll do it, but I only want to do it if it relates to the fact that you're on Bowery in you know, this increasingly gentrifying neighborhood, and there's some way that that can be acknowledged. And I didn't hear back from them. But um, the, uh, what about that as a way out, as getting more institutions to be place-based, as a way to get beyond this sort of corporate uh, bottleneck? Well, you know, I think that that's really interesting in relationship to, to art museums, because they are, of course, um, they're also, if they're not spo sponsored by corporations, they may be sponsored by wealthy individuals. And a lot of that has to do with the, the kind of phenomena that we see across the world, where you go to museums, and they're not responding to place. They're responding to this international art world. So you see the same things in every museum in the same place. Well, I don't want to go to San Francisco and see the same thing I can see here. I want to see something about what art means in San Francisco. I don't want to go to Chicago and see exactly what I'm seeing in New York. And you know, I want those places to respond, but the people who are giving the work to the museums and the people who are sponsoring the work are giving the exact same kinds of things to these museums. So they, I agree with you, they're not place-based, but they are, but they are um, institutionalized within this kind of international art world that has the same names and that that um, give a museum its kind of authority and its, and its uh, prestige. I think also in terms of, like, if you've got this kind of structural analysis of the different things that museums are doing, I think that's exactly, I mean, you're already in the right place. Like, the place where those critiques can happen, the ground the museum in the place that it's in, are kind of in education departments and workshops. And then there's this other circuit that you're describing of, like, this international kind of uh, shuttling around of works and curators um, that tends to be a little bit disconnected from that, I think, within within museums. But the place that it can happen is there, I think. But I think that's a really interesting thing, like how those two things interact. And I don't necessarily have an answer for that question. Kim? Oh, I did. <laughs> Becca? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, if you don't know, there was a big plaza that the Metropolitan Museum just unveiled this last week. It was a uh, um, multi-million dollar, I don't remember the figure, right? Donation by David Koch. And Occupy Museums showed up along with the Illuminator Collective. Um, to make us think about it using, again, the vocabulary of the institution. Um, in this case, maybe stretching the bounds of the Met's vocabulary to um, include performance art. Um, and uh, when the Illuminator came to do a projection later that evening, they had three of the members of the collective were arrested and detained. Um, thanks to that, it showed up in ArtNet and Hyperallergic the following day, and now has kind of taken on a life in the media, media sphere. Um, so for us, we saw our project, um, one as originally being inspired by learning that David Koch, one of the probably the biggest, the funder of the largest network of groups that either deny or misrepresent climate science, as well as um, the the guy who runs Coke Industries, which is one of the U.S.'s largest greenhouse gas emitters, um, sits on the board of an institution whose mission is to celebrate nature. And it rose these questions of, um, is it the institution's uh, role to be facilitator or advocate? Uh, against a backdrop of increasing economic and environmental disruption, how do institutions remain relevant? Is it all about gadgets and interactivity and, you know, and participation? Or is it about championing a version of nature that's capable of sustaining life for generations to come? Um, so the thing that I'll say about how do we deal with David Koch? Um, well, one, uh, we're big fans of mimicry and iteration. 
So when we heard about what folks were doing in the UK with Liberate Tate, we saw an opportunity to internationalize that and extend it into new sectors beyond arts institutions to museums of science and natural history. Um, we are also very inspired by campaigns of um, NGOs that uh, have been pressuring um, public television and radio to dump coke uh, as a board member. So that was um, successful here in New York. Um, and now there's an active campaign to get Coke off of WGBH in Boston, um, which is the network that produces the science show Nova. Um, so if you're interested in plugging into that, um, check out uh, the website of the NGO Forecast the Facts. They're a climate campaigning organization. Finally, I'll say this is something we have up our, our sleeve, and I can tell you a little bit about it, but um, we're planning at the end of this uh, run here um, to release a letter with 20 scientists around the world, some of the most prominent um, scientists, climate scientists, Nobel Prize winning, and IPCC authors who have signed on to a letter we initiated to call on museums of science and natural history to cut ties to the fossil fuel industry and to any funders of groups that misrepresent climate science. So we plan to release that to the media along with a kind of creative visibility action um, and then uh, a number of other things I can't tell you about, but uh, that will hopefully build momentum. So we see this as a springboard and a launching pad for an effort to push back on the corporatization of our cultural institutions um, and to also get more granular or specific or pointy-ended with a campaign to get Coke um, to, to remove our power brokers from positions of power. That, that's all fabulous. I mean, the irony is they think they created a little bit of public space in front of the Met with their name all over it, and in fact, they're doing more harm for public space, like air and water <laughs> and trees and life um, than anybody on the planet, but um, you can always see these fountains as our tears or, or they're just pissing on corporate, you know, I mean, cultural institutions. Um, but it's, that's fabulous what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. I saw another question over there. Well, after the political speech, I don't know if I should go back to this other art question. Is that okay? Yes. So I was actually thinking, um, First of all, thank you for all the presentations. It was really enjoying that. But I was thinking that all of the models that were presented were within the museum. And I wanted to hear a little more about what is called positive institutional critique, being coined by Maria Lind, about this idea of creating parallel institutions by artists or by people who want to do institutional critique as a way of, uh, you know, dialogue with the institution from the outside of it. So if you can talk a little bit more about it, it would be great. Uh, no, you go first and I'll... I mean, I, I think that, I don't think that positive institutional critique has to happen from the outside. I mean, I think that, I think that your exhibition is very much an example of how the institution can be shown how to be a better institution. And I, and I think for me, like working with museums changed very dramatically after Fred Wilson's Mining the Museum project. And it wasn't because um, Fred's critique was withering, it was that Fred's critique showed the Baltimore Historic Society how to make a better museum, how to be more responsible, more um, honest. And I, so I think that all a lot of the institutional critiques since that have really been a kind of, about a kind of positive engagement with the institution itself. Uh, that uh, that uh, the institution has a lot of um, self-censoring boundaries uh, that are that are caught up with ideology that are pretty easy to break. And once you do that, I don't think those institutions uh, so so readily snap back. And so you know, I think that the work that Andrea has done, Andrea Fraser has done, and, and Fred Wilson have really opened things up in a, in a very interesting way. I don't think that um, you know when Andrea says she's the institution. I don't think that that's necessarily bad. Yeah, and I think, I, I mean, for Liberate Tate's work, that's, they're definitely not, uh, they're not meant to be in the museum, they're not invited into the museum. Like, I don't know how clear that was. Like, I think the Tate are just too, like, no, it would be a bad idea to arrest any of us when we do it, because that would backfire even more. 
um, and they're already not very good at PR. Um, <laughs> but I, but there is there is a kind of I, I think I guess the answer is like in terms of like other institutions, they're not necessarily opposed to the museum, but they do have these important bases of support, which are in external institutions. So working with uh, like local radical arts centres and communities. Um, plugging into all of that, as well as plugging into like local activist groups, like all of those things, connected is the way, the reason that Liberate Tate works, it, it, because it has those bases of support. Um, and so, if you are setting up some kind of alternative art space to counter and critique, I think the thing, if it's going to work, it needs to be connected in those ways to those other kind of centres of power. Um, otherwise, it, you know, it, it's kind of shouting into the void. Well, uh, maybe I can. Uh, uh, the uh, annual report of Sachi and Sachi in the, the 80s. Uh, they uh, came up with this brilliant idea to quote Lenin. And Lenin apparently said, everything is connected to everything else. <laughs> And if you take that seriously, and I propose to do it so, uh, then uh, no matter where you uh, operate, it, it may have uh, uh, repercussions. And on, on that note, we are going to we, we are going to wrap up. But I think that this is a really really interesting and important point. And I think in terms of what we're doing here, or what. Uh, not an alternative is doing here with the Natural History Museum is we have to remember that we're uh, this is coordinated with the People's Clan and March on, on September 21st um, and the way of, uh, that artists and activists coordinate together, connect in order to scale up the visibility and the impact of the projects I think that that's something that we really need to consider and so this idea of creating parallel institutions I think could also uh, we could see another way which is to create connected institutions or to mobilize together um, from inside and uh, in parallel with external kind of agents or external uh, practices. And I think that that's happening. Yes, and I'll also say, um, Tanya, thank you for your question. It is something that we took very seriously in conceptualizing this project as one that um, borrows from or uh, you know is uh, engaged in institutional critique but also we wanted to build build an institution of critique um, and so the natural history museum um, it's something we talked about is that like how how are we not just occupying an institution but occupying institutionality um, in order to um, one lift up the work of both artists and activists um, and articulate them in a way uh, that suggests a movement rather than fragmented and isolated expressions. Um, and two, uh, kind of, you know, tra trains, invites and trains people um, to, uh, to view a perspective on nature and the representation of nature um, in a way that understands that that's a very political thing. Um, are you looking at a bear or a diorama of a bear? And uh, if it's a diorama, then someone constructed it. And is there a politics to the choice of how that representation was constructed? And is something missing or omitted from that? So uh, I just want to take a brief moment to tell you uh, a little more about um, the upcoming panels um, and also the upcoming uh, manifestation of this project. We're planning on doing um, tours with folks like uh, Mark Dyan and others who have some relationship to the subject matter of natural history museums inside the American Museum of Natural History and uh, other museums. And uh, in addition, workshops with high school and university students around the country. That will also include tours inside these museums where we'll invite folks to brainstorm um, augmentations of or interventions on existing exhibits. Um, and then kind of crowdsource and present those um, as an art exhibition um, in 2015. Um, and then of those kind of crowdsourced uh, ideas, um, actually selecting and fabricating a number of the best ones to deploy inside natural history museums. Um, and uh, so first I want to say thank you so much to all of our panelists. This was a 
dream for us uh, and a dream assemblage of people. Um, and I thank you for your work. Um, I come from a generation, and I think certainly millennials come from um, a very anti-institutional stance. Um, yet part of that is like the uh, residue of an understanding of power that perhaps is outdated. Right? Power no longer emanates from centralized bureaucratic source as much as in the social media age. Um, it acts through us and on us. And um, as progressives, people, um, we've perhaps had a, a, an allergic uh, relationship to power. Um, and you know, it, it made a lot of sense to celebrate the, the DIY and the, the countercultural institutions we were developing. But now we need to franchise them and um, re reconnect with institutions of power that have been for decades hollowed out because of neoliberalism and privatization and an increasing um, uh, pressure of the market. Um, so it's our belief that these institutions represent resources, infrastructure, and ideals that are worth fighting for um, at the same time that we build our own. Uh, so next week, um, kind of extending the theme, we're going to do a panel here called Words from Our Sponsors, The Genealogy of Patronage in Museums. This is with uh, Wayne Modest, who's a museum anthropologist and director of um, curation and exhibitions at a couple of museums in Amsterdam, um, as well as Dr. Alice Bell, who was an educator in, uh, science mu in the London Museum of Science at the time that Shell um, sponsored the Energy Gallery, and they got a, a, a briefing as staff on what to do if Greenpeace showed up. And Greenpeace never showed up. Um, but they, uh, they said to one another, hmm, kind of wish they had. And she uh, left museums to go into academia teaching climate science communications to scientists at the Royal Academy when the administration approached her and asked if it was cool for BP and Shell to co-create the curriculum um, without a hint of irony. Uh, and she said that that was happening all the time. So she left and is now a freelance journalist and editor at the Guardian Science section who specializes in particular in um, the corporate embedding of science communication and, uh, and cultural institutions around the world. Um, so that should be interesting, moderated by Steve Duncombe. Um, the next day, we won't be doing anything here. We will be out in the streets, and we invite you to join us at the People's Climate March. Um, it kicks off at 11.30 a.m. by Columbus Circle. Um, and on the 27th, the following Saturday, we have a few events um, starting at 1 o'clock. We're going to have a tour by Juan Camilo Osorio of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance of the Panorama, the kind of marquee standing exhibit of this museum. Um, it's a to-scale model of New York City. And so he will be interacting with that model to talk about um, the relationship between and opportunities of uh, urban planning and climate change here in New York City. Um, and then following that, Wes Gillingham, the program director of Catskill Mountain Keeper. Um, we'll do a tour called What the Frack Are You Drinking in the uh, watershed model room here, which is a, a 540 square foot relief map that was um, built during the works as a Works Progress Administration project um, and launched around the 1939 World's Fair. So he's um, a specialist in New York's watershed and in particular um, how fracking poses a threat to our watershed and to our drinking water. And then after that same day um, is Climate Wars, Propaganda, Debate, and the Propaganda of Debate. And that's with historian Stuart Ewan, scientist Michael Mann, and James Hogan, um, a PR guy who co-founded uh, or started DSmog blog and wrote a book called um, Climate Cover-Up. Um, and then uh, the following day, a panel um, called Seeing the Display, Environmentalism's Ideological Habitat. And that's with Peter Anker, Fred Turner, and Jody Dean, moderated by Astra Taylor. This is where we're looking at the politics and ideology embedded in displays in uh, museums and world fairs. And finally, um, uh, October 
Oh, I'll skip over the tour. So October 4th, closing panels, Anthropocene, Capitalocene, or Ecology for All, with Christian Parenti, Jason Moore, Razmik Kuchian, and moderated by Liza Featherstone. Um, Edward Abbey has a great quote where he talks about capitalism as the ideology of the cancer cell, unlimited growth in a finite system. And this panel will consider the violent legacies of capitalism's exploitation and appropriation of nature and in inquires into how views of natural systems as separate from human systems may be a part of the problem that we face in confronting climate change. Um, finally, uh, we wanted to end in a more um, kind of a, a catapulting us forward um, note called uh, Counter Power for Climate Justice with Gopal Dayanani, Eddie Bautista, and Elizabeth Yampier, um, all activists who've been very engaged in the climate justice movement. Um, so uh, here, we felt it was important to understand climate change not as an issue of counting carbon, um, but rather one of looking at the asymmetries in the burden of responsibility and the burden of impact. And that requires that we acknowledge the ways that inequalities are deeply embedded in the systems that continue to produce and deny climate change, hindering our ability to mobilize against it. So in the wake of uh, what's anticipated to be the world's largest mobilization around the topic of climate change, um, we're asking these climate justice activists um, how they're shifting the discourse and building a movement. What are the next steps? Um, so again, if you're interested in learning more about um, our programs, do sign up and check out the um, essay that corresponds with what you see here. And um, I'll close with, again, a thank you and round of applause for everybody sitting up here.